And so all you're doing really when you sign it is saying that you acknowledge that you have no privacy. That's actually what your signature is saying because because if you've read it or understood it, you know you have no privacy. But that's not how they present it to you. They say, well, this is a HIPAA privacy form. Twyla, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks so much, Artie. Yeah, we're going to talk a bit about your book. Uh, well, first of all, a little bit about you. You're a registered nurse. You are the founder and co-founder and president of Citizens Council for Health Freedom. And you're an author of Big Brother in the Exam Room, uh, The Dangerous Truth About Electronic Health Records, which we'll talk a bit about today. Um, is there anything that you would like to add about yourself before we go on? Well, I am, my history is as an emergency room nurse, a pediatric emergency room nurse. So I've taken care of a lot of patients in my time before starting this organization. Uh, I was also a school nurse, which is really handy for the schools because I was an emergency room pediatric nurse. So, um, but that was a place that I learned bureaucracy and found that I didn't like it. And so then I've really, um, just been here doing healthcare policy, healthcare freedom policy uh, ever since. I've, I've been doing this for like 30 years. And so um, I began when the Clintons began trying to take over the healthcare system and have been working ever since to try to bring back freedom for the patient and the doctor. Hmm. Well, healthcare is a complex topic for a lot of people. Um, you know, we, we have a very limited view of everything that goes on, uh, most people just being patients. and. There are a lot of things that you pointed out in your book that I didn't realize, and I feel like I try to keep up to speed on things. So uh, most people go into the doctor, they're handed, uh, they could get uh, an iPad or something like that to fill out forms, but they're going to get forms to fill out. And one of those forms is the HIPAA disclosure. And me and many other people understood that, or I understood, I don't understand it this way anymore, but most people believe that's protecting their privacy. And you lay it out really well in the book that that's not what's going on. Could you elaborate on that a bit for listeners? Sure. Well, I'm glad that you got into the privacy aspect of healthcare to start because that is one of the things that we are known for doing. And I'll just say as a foundational statement to that is we say, he who holds the data makes the rules. And so just think about all the tyrants that we have ever had in the world that we know about. What do they have? They have surveillance systems. They profile their people. They track their people. They surveil their people and they use it to control their people. So one of the things about HIPAA is that it really is considered a permissive data sharing rule. And one of, uh, one of the ways that they convinced you that it was actually a privacy rule, not a data sharing rule, was to get you to sign that form. And so the rule says that your doctor, your hospital, your facility, whomever, has to ask you to sign the form. Now, the law doesn't say you have to sign the form. And we have an entire campaign to get you to not sign the form. But if you do sign the form, here's what's actually happening. You, this is the Notice of Privacy Practices form, or it's the Notice of Privacy Practices Acknowledgement Statement in a regular consent form. So there's really five ways that it comes, and I can talk about that later. But no matter what, what you are doing is that you are saying that you have either um, read, received, or understood the clinic or the hospital's notice of privacy practices. Hmm. And that's all you're saying. You're not saying anything about privacy and how to deal with your records. You're, you're not saying anything. You're just saying that you've received, read, or understood the clinic's notice of privacy practices. Now, if you look at the notice of privacy practices, you will see that it is a list of the ways they can share your information without your consent. And uh, clinics and hospitals often have a standard way, which just is all the ways under HIPAA that it can be shared without your consent. Some clinics are more uh, limited, but most of them aren't. And so all you're doing really when you sign it is saying that you acknowledge that you have no privacy. Hmm. That's actually what your signature is saying because, because if you've read it or understood it, you know you have no privacy, but that's not how they present it to you. They say, well, this is a HIPAA privacy form. 
And for those of us who follow our campaign to not sign that form, by, because by law, you don't have to. The federal government even says you don't have to. Uh, oftentimes, the clinics will say, well, why don't you want to sign that form? I mean, this is all about your privacy. And it's only the person who has uh, listened to your uh, podcast here or read my book or has heard a presentation from me somewhere uh, that knows that this has nothing to do with protecting their privacy. It's all a big ruse, or as we call it, a deliberate deception to get you to believe you have privacy when HIPAA took it all away. So I, I think hopefully that's a bit of a understanding to answer your question. No, no, very good. Um, what did we have before HIPAA? Like, bef- I mean, HIPAA's been around, what, since the 90s? Is that right? 1996 was when the law passed, and 2003 is when the rule was became effective. So what we had before that was just the legal obligation for the hospital, the doctor, whomever, to hold your data confidential unless they got your consent. Hmm. Uh, The only things that um, uh, changed that were if there was a state law that said that your, your privacy could be intruded for some government purpose, such as things like the tumor or the cancer registry or the uh, immunization or vaccination registry. Those are actual laws at the state level that allow them to intrude on your privacy and you don't even know it. Some of your listeners are right now going, what? (laughs) Um, But every state has a immunization registry. Every state has a cancer registry. They have a newborn screening registry, which is actually a genetic registry of babies. Mm. Um, and so for those laws, those were the only ones that allowed the doctor or the hospital to share your data without your consent. HIPAA opens it up and says, you can share it for any reason. You who hold the data can share it for any reason uh, that you choose without getting the patient's consent. There are very, very, very few limitations to that. And for research, there's some additional requirements but like you can share it with the government without the patient's consent. Uh, uh, there is a um, 2010 regulation out of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services where they listed all the entities that are affected by HIPAA. So under the HIPAA rule. And there are 702,000 covered entities. Hmm. Now, covered entities has an actual meaning. But the best way to understand this is to to know that it's all the people that you think will have access to your records, like the laboratory, the radiology facility, your doctor, the clinic, the hospital, um, the health plan. You know, those are the covered entities. There's also healthcare clearinghouses, and most people don't even know about those. But they're also within that 702,000 covered entities that have your data. And they are allowed to share your data without your consent between each other, but also with 1.5 million business associates, like attorneys, analytic groups, all sorts of companies, merger and acquisition companies, you name it. The, the, the list is, it's not endless, but there is a definition in HIPAA called healthcare operations. And then all the people who do those healthcare operations are are typically companies outside of your clinic and hospital. Hmm. And there are 65 of those operations, broad things like the sale of the clinic, uh, like uh, medical schools, um, analytics, quality analytics, uh, profiling, all sorts of things that are in that definition. Uh, And for all of those things, your data can be used with your name and everything else uh, without your consent. Uh, it's wild to learn that, um, especially with the, I guess, rhetoric around HIPAA. Um, when, when I think about it, like I'm, I was born in '85, so even when it got like completely enacted, I'm 18. I'm just barely getting to the point of using health insurance on my own, and I'm I'm trying to picture what things were like before. So, if somebody in the early nineties wanted to go to the doctor. They're going to possibly have to get some labs. They might have to get some blood work drawn. Uh, They might have to go to another hospital to get imaging done. So there's already some sharing of data. How, how did that work? Did they 
contact the patient for each one of those and say, hey, we're going to send your data here. Is that okay? And they had to ask you for each and every like time that your data would be shared. Usually there is a consent form. That's an actual consent. Like um, um, I consent to you providing treatment for me and your the people that you need that are a part of that treatment to uh, provide the care or the information necessary. It's been so long since we've had one of those consent forms that would also allow the, sh- the necessary sharing between like you need the lab right? and the lab's got to give that information. So within that, within that grouping, but it was very limited just because the information was sent to the lab and then the the actual data was sent back to the doctor didn't mean that the lab could share the data anywhere else. Yeah. So it was, uh, and they knew that legally they were on the line if they shared it. There was nothing to give them the right to share it outside of that patient doctor or that clinician patient relationship, that patient encounter uh, there was nothing in the law that allowed them to do that unless it was a specific exemption in the law, like I said, with those databases or, or other things. Yeah. It's it's interesting. I think people who are skeptical of government uh, are already aware of like they're already on top of things like this to some degree, knowing that a law doesn't mean it's going to do what it, they say it's going to do. It's also a problem with how they bill laws you know, a 1200 page bill gets dubbed with a a one liner, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a privacy (laughs) law or whatever it might be, which I mean, is just asinine to believe that a a, a thousand page bill can be summed up with one word. Or if if it could, there'd be no reason for the 999 other pages, right? (laughs) So people are looking at this and it, it looks like, so prior to HIPAA, we have privacy. Then HIPAA comes along, our privacy is wiped away, and they call it privacy. I just want to make sure I'm getting that straight, right? <laughs> That's correct. And while you, whenever you ask me the next question, you go right into section four of the book that you're holding in front of you, and you can show your all your uh, listeners and viewers the actual diagrams of uh, their line diagrams from Harvard, uh, what's it called? The Harvard Privacy Lab. And it shows before HIPAA and after HIPAA. And so you can just, um, you know, pull those up and uh, share them with people so they can see an actual picture of how it looks now. And so all of these claims, it's in section four, but all of these claims that there is something called privacy, well, there isn't unless you are outside of the system, like maybe in a cash-based doctor. So we have the Wedge of Health Freedom, which is a a cash-based system that we are building outside of the current system, right? And we ask them before they can get in, they have to say that they hold the records confidential, that they don't share it. Uh, you know, they could have electronic health records, but they can't be linked up like to the different um, health information exchanges, the state ones, the federal one, all of that sort of thing. Yeah. So this this is the section you're talking about. Yes, right that's here, correct. Right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. HIPAA and then, or no HIPAA and then No HIPAA, HIPAA and then HIPAA. That's correct. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you really, you know, want to understand, and the funny thing about this is, I don't know, it was probably about six years ago or so uh, that a colleague and I went to Washington, D.C., and we had 22 meetings with uh, members of Congress, or rather their staffers. It's really hard to actually meet with members of Congress, but what your listeners might not know is the people who are the staffers really kind of tell the members what to do and what Mm. is. And so it's really important to get to the staffers. Anyway, so we had um, 22 meetings. And at each meeting, we asked them, what does it mean when you sign the HIPAA form in the exam room? To a person, 22 offices. They said, it means that my information is between me and my doctor. Mm. So they are the ones who counsel members of Congress, they are the health policy staffers and they do not know what HIPAA really is because of course it's a deliberate deception. A lot of them are young. And even if you're old, you you know, this is a message that comes to you in the exam room, the clerks on the outside at the hospital, you know, this protects your privacy. No, no, it doesn't. 
It's a roof. Yeah, we're just we hear it constantly every time we go to the doctor. Oh, this these are just privacy forms. These are just showing you that you have. You're just acknowledging that your data is your data. Like right. you get told the, those <laughs> things all the time. Who pushed HIPAA? Like why did it come about in the first place? Yeah, so uh, uh, in the book, I go over the history of HIPAA as well as the history of the electronic health record mandate, which was to digitize all of this data that was now accessible to all of these people, making it just more easily accessible, right? And so, um, and I will say that there was a, there's a Democrat who is a member of a state legislature that read the whole book and mm-hmm. told me that he thought it was the best history of what happened that he'd ever read. He doesn't agree with the kind of privacy rights that we in our organization want to make happen across the country. But he did say, and he, and his whole business is health data. Yeah. So he knows, right? Uh, and so we told the history and the history really is um, all the people who thought the data was valuable to them. Uh, so the government, so they created a group called WEDI, the Work Group for Electronic Data Interchange. And Weedy pushed to get access to everybody's data. And then in 1996, the law said that that uh, our data could be digitized. That was that was HIPAA, which the P, by the way, doesn't stand for privacy at all. It stands for the law, which is the Health Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Two mm-hmm. A's, one P. Health Insurance Portability. An accountability act. And it's talking about the portability of insurance. So if you look at that title, you would never guess that there was the elimination of privacy within that enormous piece of legislation now law. And, uh, it had a section called administrative simplification and it did what Hillary wanted to do in her, uh, bill, you know, when she had, uh, when she and Bill had the national security act, which is to take over the entire healthcare system and put us all in HMOs. Um, so uh, her her whole piece was to not only digitize our data, create a centralized um, place for all the data and uh, create protocols for doctors to practice and then protect them if they practice following these protocols. So they put this part in HIPAA And they said that you could do administrative simplification by digitizing all the data. And then they said on their, uh, they put a mandate on Congress itself and said, you, Congress has to pass a privacy law within three years or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has to write a rule. Well, Congress did not want to pass a privacy law because their whole intent was to get rid of our privacy. And they did not want to be the ones that would be responsible for it. So they they brought up a privacy bill that never went anywhere. And then, of course, it came, got up to the HHS deciding and having to write the rule, the HIPAA privacy privacy rule. Hmm. And Secretary Donna Shalala, who was uh, head, the Secretary of the Health and Human Services, comes out with these recommendations for Congress before she started to write the rule. And in her recommendations, she said, there's an age old right to privacy. And then she said, but we need to change that and use this data for publicly useful purposes. And so therefore the rule took away the age old right to privacy and exchanged it for using the data for publicly useful purposes as determined by herself and the rest of HHS, who is, of course, being influenced by everybody who wanted access to all of the data. So so in essence, you had corporations, government, the healthcare system, researchers, all of these people who, who saw enormous value in having all of this access to our private data without our consent. And you know, just to give you an idea of how lucrative this can be, it's lucrative on at least two sides. It's lucrative on the side of getting all this data allows them to profile the doctor and the patient, allows them to control the doctor, which means it allows them to limit what the doctor can do to the patient and thereby the health plans and the government save money by being able to control what the what happens in the exam room and tying the doctor's hands because they got all the data 
uh, Medicare and Medicaid are government funded programs and they can use the power uh, of, of being the, the payer, the third party payer in the Medicaid and Medicare to essentially alter the entire practice in the exam room for everyone. So it's lucrative because it lets them keep more money for themselves or keep more money in the government or keep more money in the health plan. Yeah. But and then it's also lucrative for what they can do with the data. And so United Health Group, which is the largest health plan in the world and certainly in the United States, um, they have a data health data division. It's called Optum Insights. And I believe it was in, I just have to remember the, um, it was in 2018, no, 2017, where they reported, I believe it was $8.1 billion in revenue. Now, they don't take care of any patients. All they do is data. They slice and dice. They get the data. They do, you know, they put out things using the data, whatever, right? Um, and I believe it was in 2023, their revenue was $18.1 billion. Hmm. So this is, this is a gold mine for them. Um, it is the 21st century version of a gold mine, or some people call it the 21st century version of an oil well, hmm. <laughs> of oil. Yeah. <laughs> and, and people are, are just going around feeling really calm about the fact that their privacy for the most intimate things that they reveal to their doctor to get the care that they need, they're being very calm about it because, of course, it's all protected. But it isn't. And all of this data is going into the hands of those who want to use it for their own purposes, which means essentially that the exam room has become an area of exploitation because Mm. most patients are asked to fill out extensive questionnaires. These are just data gathering tools. They have nothing to do with the reason why the patient is there that day. They're asked to come into the portal and add information in the portal. Uh, They reveal certain things about them by coming into the portal. There are other problems with the portal, which you could ask me about later. I just mentioned the portal just a tiny little bit in the book. Um, but it's really become an area of exploitation because if you don't fill out these forms, if you don't sign HIPAA, sometimes they don't actually want to see you. They will tell you, they will dismiss you as a patient. Mm-hmm. You will be a bother to them uh, because you are not helping them gather all the data they need to get paid by the health plans or by the government. So, so really, you know, I'm a nurse. We're supposed to be advocates for patients. We're supposed to protect patients. The exam room is supposed to be a safe spot, a sanctuary. Say anything you have to say, no matter how embarrassing or difficult or uncomfortable it is to say, because we as the healthcare professionals are not going to judge you. We are going to take care of you. And in order to get you the care you need, you have to tell us whatever it is that you don't want anybody else to know. And we promise to hold it secret. So now when you go to the hospital and you tell them maybe you had recent drug use that you don't want other people to know about, but it might be relevant to your medical situation. When you reveal that information, that might go to countless other entities and you have no idea, you have no, you have no control over that anymore at all. There are some limits on psychological notes. There have been some limits on behavioral and chemical information. But that, that, uh, those limits are decreasing. I think the psychological notes is still on, but there's really a very big effort to let everybody access your chemical health and behavioral health information without your consent. They're, 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 I don't think they're there yet, but the consent process is more limited and less, um, I don't know how to say the best way to say this. They've made it so that it's easier for them to get the data. You might give a consent only one time and then they have access to everything, but you might think it's a, but I can't quite remember, but they are loosening. They are loosening the consent provisions little mm-hmm. by little in behavioral and, chem- and chemical health. Interesting. And with this, it, it seems like from, from reading the book that HIPAA is only a part of the problem. Like there are other problems around electronic health records and stuff like that. But what I, I'm kind of curious about is when it comes to this privacy that we're supposed to have that we really don't have, where 
where does it actually end up? Like, are we just looking at a complete surveillance state eventually? Or like, where does this lead to ultimately? Um, I'm not certain. It depends probably on who you talk to and who's okay. got power. And because uh, some people would like it to go to a complete surveillance state because they they want to impose. So part of what uh, HIPAA did was to impose four identification numbers, tracking numbers. Um, one of them for um, employers, one for health plans, one for doctors, and one for patients. Uh, interestingly enough, several years ago, the health plans got rid of theirs. Hmm. The government just decided to give up that one, but they didn't give up the one for doctors, which allows every doctor and every doctor's decision to be tracked. And we have uh, we have stopped over probably the last, um, our organization itself, probably the last nine, 10 years. Uh, but Senator, uh, yeah, no. Congressman Ron Paul, and then taken up by Senator Rand Paul, who we have helped to stop the unique patient identifier. And so there has been a push to have this unique tracking number for all of our medical records, which we have helped to stop over time and as well as these members. Um, but with those four identifiers, that was the whole idea, right? That everything would be tracked. It would all be government issued numbers. The whole move here, when you ask about where is this going, the whole move here is to get to a socialized, universal healthcare system run by the government, controlled by the government, limited by the government, um, all the doctors under government control. Because if you don't have a socialized healthcare system, it's harder to have a socialized medical care and coverage system. So I do believe that uh, this is all part of... Um, taking us towards a fully run government system for care and coverage. As a matter of fact, if you saw that in my book, when they did the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare, uh, getting uh, the mandate for electronic health records was part of the foundation for Obamacare and the move to nationalize the healthcare system. So that is where it's going. But of course, all of that means that it will be completely under surveillance, under control, under budgets. Whoever's in charge gets to decide who are the people who don't get cared. You know, when you think about um, England, um, I don't know if it's the same, but I do believe England is at age 65. You cannot have a kidney transplant. Now, I don't know if that if they have kept it like that, but, you know, the the. The group of people, the population in the United States that is growing the fastest by percentage are the centurions. Hmm. Now, imagine hitting 65, having some kind of a kidney issue, and there's no dialysis available for you because you've hit 65. And yet, like, your parents reach 85 or 90, right? Yeah. But so there are cutoffs. And so Canada has cutoffs. England has cutoffs. These government-run healthcare systems have cutoffs. Even Oregon's Medicaid system for the poor has cutoffs. They have a ranking. They have a the, the very interesting ranking system of priority for care. And at one time, um, um, sterilization was something like number seven or number eight in importance for how the money would be spent, right? So it becomes about political agendas and ideas for people about what is valuable and what isn't. And if you want to have a population control agenda, you'll put sterilization really high up, higher up than, you know, taking care of somebody with a heart attack. And it, yeah. and it was, or taking care of a woman with breast cancer. It was higher up than, uh, than something that most people would go, what? <laughs> yeah. You're going to spend more money as a bigger priority than on this woman who has an entire family or this man who has an, you know, is contributing all of this to society, you know, so it becomes political yeah. agendas and personal agendas that decide what, what, what care you can and cannot have. All of that sounds horrible to me, but some people in our current political climate, some people think of capitalism as bad and socialism as good. And they, they, they think they might hear the word socialized medicine and think, oh, that doesn't sound so bad because we're, we're often focused on pricing. We're, we're always focused on 
What's it cost me? How much is this costing? And while there are downsides to socialized medicine in other countries, the cost is often referred to by people that support it. So for the people that might not balk at that word socialized medicine, what what would you have to say to them beyond what you already have of why that might not be a good thing even for their pocketbooks? Yeah, so if you look at socialized medicine cultures, right? And people say it doesn't cost anything to go to the doctor. But of course, it's really hard for them to move ahead as individuals. It's hard for them because so much money is taken out in taxes uh, in order to cover these kinds of things that they don't have a choice. And of course, when they take money out of your income in taxes, it has to flow through a lot of different hands, taking out a little here and a little there and a little here and a little there. And at the end, all that money that they took out for health care does not actually get to health care. There's some percent of it left, right? which means that they have to ration that care. They're not saving your money and saying it's going to be available here for you uh, in uh, for your care. And we can really see that in the Medicare system, which we could talk about too here in this country. Um, but the fact of the matter is it's very expensive to have the government run something that could be run privately. It also doesn't encourage competition or competitive prices or innovation. So I think it was uh, a speaker that we had maybe in 2018 in Canada. He runs a, a company called Timely Medical Alternatives. He takes Canadians who need care to the United States. He sends them to Belgium. He sends them all around the country where they can actually get timely access to medical care. And of course, you have to be able to pay for that out of your own pocket after Canada has taken, you know, probably half of your income for all of these different taxes yeah. and the ways that they say that they are going to take care of you. So now when when you need care and the government says no, and you realize it's somewhere out there, you could get it out there. You could go to India and get it. You'll pay for it on your own. And then, and you might pay for it, and it might even be less than you could get it in the United States. That's possible, but still you have less money to pay for it. But it just shows you how important your health is. People, when they're actually sick, will take, they'll find money from all sorts of places yeah. to get themselves the care that they need to live, you know, a longer life, for example. Uh, and so a lot of people aren't thinking about that. And in Canada, a lot of the Canadians really love their healthcare system until it says no to them. Some of them just say, well, I guess that's just the way it is because they're like in that mindset. They're not in the, it's like whatever the government says, but really wise Canadians uh, uh, come down to the United States and get the care they need. I think it was the premier who went to the state of Maine and got his care for a heart condition. <laughs> he didn't wait in line in Canada. No, no, no. no. <laughs> And so, uh, and so that's what happens in a socialized healthcare system. You know, you have to wait, you have to get in line. Um, this guy at Timely Medical Alternatives talked about a really, a really disastrous case of a very young girl. I think she was like eight or seven or something like that. She had an ear infection and then the infection didn't quite go away. And then they decided she had to have surgery, I think, to clean it out or whatever. And that, that surgery kept getting pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And then she lost her hearing in that ear. And finally, the, the parents said, we're going to go to timely medical alternatives because some, because, oh, she got lethargic. She started to just, she couldn't go to school anymore. And they're still pushing her surgery back. Right. And so yeah. they took her to timely medical alternatives, which sent her to, I think it was maybe Billingham, Washington, I believe. And the doctor came out and said, okay, here's the situation. Um, um, I think we can save her life, but I don't know if we can save her hearing. Now, it starts out with an ear infection that could have been solved very quickly. That got pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until her very life was threatened. And indeed, I think maybe she is hearing now in one ear. They did save her life, but the infection had spread into her brain. Yeah. And that's what happens in socialized medicine cultures. Or, or actually, that guy also uh, told us the story about having only eight medications available for some condition where in the United States, there's like countless medication yeah. options. But in Canada, they only give you the eight. And if it doesn't work for you, you know, too bad. Yeah, I mean, with socialized medicine, is that why... 
people that are on, if, if you have more control over your own insurance and stuff like that, you might be able to call a specialist if you know you need a specialist without going to like a primary care physician. But a lot of people on Medicare, Medicaid, they have to go to their primary, primary care and get referred to a specialist before they can go. They might have something going on with their ears or their nose or something like that. And they're like, I need an ear, nose, and throat doctor. But they still have to go through all the hoops. Is that why? Well, what I like to say, uh, because um, what we have in this country and in America is we have the corporate version of socialized medicine, Mm -hmm. and it's called a health plan. And when Ted Kennedy, who was an advocate of a single payer system, when he introduced the HMO Act of 1973, which was approved, by the way, by Nixon, who really liked this idea of the HMO, I believe that it was his plan to get us all used to the health plans telling us no, so that eventually we would be agreeable to a single payer system where the government would tell us no. We'd Mm. be used to being told no, because in real insurance, you are not told no. There's no prior authorization. Nobody interferes with whatever the the doctor's decision is. Uh, And they just just simply pay the bill under their contractual obligation to help you cover all of your medical care. People today don't even remember real insurance. Major medical catastrophic policies that simply sent you a check and you used it to pay your own bills. Nobody got in the middle. Healthcare, medical expenses, medical coverage was all so much less expensive because it was uh, competitive and it was all on a cash basis. And that's where our organization wants to go back to. But so today in the United States, we have uh, the corporate version of socialized medicine called the health plan. Now you asked about Medicare. So about 52% of the Medicare population is in a health plan. They have chosen something called Medicare Advantage, which uses the health plan to run the uh, the Medicare program. So for them, the federal government gives a certain amount of money per enrollee per month to the health plan every month. But then it also gives the health plan the authority to deny access to care. And so they are supposed to be providing uh, care that is medically necessary for med- for Medicare approved, you know, conditions and procedures, et cetera. But the federal government has already got three reports out about the fact that Medicare Advantage health plans are denying access to medically necessary Medicare approved care. So the rationing is already happening. Uh, these plans require prior authorization and then the health plan says no. When, you know, right? And interestingly enough, one of the, uh, one of these three reports, the federal government, the, um, Office of Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says that 75% of the time, if the patients or the doctor appeal the decision, 70, uh, the denial decision, 75% of the time, the, the health plan reverses. So they give the care to the senior citizen, the Medicare enrollee. However, here's the clincher. Only 1% of all of the denials are ever appealed. So this is very lucrative for the health plan. Deny, 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 deny. And see who has the wherewithal. See who's well enough. See who has somebody who can help them. See who can speak English. See who has whatever they need and the time and the effort and the energy to go through the appeals process, which even the federal government says is burdensome to seniors. But for the health plans, very lucrative. For the most part, they never have to give out money for all of these things that they deny, many of which are uh, medically approved, Medicare approved, and medically necessary. So mm-hmm. when you're talking about in Medicare, if they have to you know, go to a primary care first and before they can get to a specialist, we are talking here about the Medicare Advantage uh, version of Medicare, which is where the government wants everyone because that's how the care can be rationed because Medicare is running out of money. However, about half of the population that's in Medicare has stayed in original Medicare. No prior authorization, 
Go to any doctor, any hospital, anywhere in the country that takes Medicare. Hmm. And so right now that's about 98%. And so there is no prior authorization. There are no denials unless it's not Medicare. Like unless uh, Medicare looks at it and says, okay, well, you've got diabetes uh, but they are ordering a, um, uh, I don't know, an abdominal x-ray for you or something that just doesn't even make sense in yeah. the reviewer's mind. But that's not often the case. Yeah, I mean, it, there are off-label uses of procedures in, and prescriptions. Uh, there are, are different reasons to do things for doctors. And most people want that decision those decisions to be made between the doctor and the patient. I talk to my doctor, he decides, he or she decides that I need a prescription or I need to uh, have a procedure or something like that. And I have the right to go and get second opinions, third opinions and all of that. But in this system, we have another entity and uh, you called it a, a what plan? A health plan. Medi a health plan. So is like, that the same I should as name them. I should name them like Kaiser, like uh, United Health Group. It's it's officially it's managed care or prepaid health care, but it is like Cigna um, yeah. where you give them all this money in advance in premiums, lots of premiums. But then they have the authority to uh, uh, prior authorize or deny or whatever. They hold on so to the in, money and decide. Insurance. What most people think of as insurance is what you're Which, talking about. Yes. And and I <laughs> I actually give a presentation called uh, 12 Facts That Expose Dangerous Myths. And facts, fact number two is that a health plan is not health insurance because a health insurance a policy is a contract between you and the insurance company to pay your medical bills, not to decide if the doctor is doing what you think is medically necessary. It's simply to pay a certain percent of your medical bills. End of statement. That's an insurance company, just like your homeowners, just like your car insurance, right? They don't go in and say, well, I actually, I don't think that that's not a big enough bump to repair. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've felt for a long time that the insurance companies played too big of a role in our medical care. You go to the doctor and it doesn't make sense to me why if I'm going to the doctor for a routine checkup, nothing special going on. Why is insurance involved? Why is a health care, uh, a health plan involved at all in those situations? Because it just doesn't seem necessary. And it seems like, well, instead of I go to the store and I buy some food or something like that. I'm paying for it right there. I'm just buying the food. There's no reason for me to have some plan with grocery stores in general that helps me or decides what foods I should get and how much and all this stuff. But with healthcare, it's completely different. And it just seems wild that we have these entities that are impersonal. They don't know us at all, um, or they don't seem to care about us from my personal mm -hmm. interactions with them. They don't. <laughs> and the money that we're putting in there, even if we have uh, employer-provided health insurance, which is still paid for, the amount of money that gets put into this stuff and the return that we see, like me, I'm almost 40 years old. I've had pretty good health my whole life. The return is never there. It's always an expense. Like when you add up everything the employer and the employee spend on it, there's very little benefit, you know, unless you're getting some procedures that are expensive or you have some more rare condition or something like that. But that's real insurance. So you're talking about real insurance and we don't have real insurance because real insurance is, as I said, it's this contract and it's this contract for insurable events. And people don't even realize that this term exists. So, you know, the car crash, the coma, the cancer, right? The really expensive chronic condition. All of that is for what, all of that is what insurance is for. What we have today is prepaid healthcare, the corporate version of socialized medicine, and all of this money that you pay up front, they just get to keep with the authority to deny you access to the care when you actually need it. 
So this has been put in place by Congress. Congress is at fault all the way across here um, because when they first let employers offer health insurance, that was the beginning of third party payment for mm-hmm. medical care. And third party payment for anything means it takes away your choice. It costs a lot of money. It puts uh, it it uh, it takes away your privacy. It's an intrusion, and other people are going to use your money in ways you never would. And so if you actually had the right to do a real insurance policy, you know, you, you, you might be paying, you know, a quarter of the amount. All the prices would come down to pocketbook level that weren't insurable events. Even like, um, I paid cash for a long time. So I paid cash for my fractured wrist, which was an $1,800 expense. Even that is not really an insurable expense. Because it's something that you can pay over a few months, or maybe you can pay it now, right? Uh, then, then charity would always be available for those who absolutely couldn't pay. And then hospitals and clinics would be back to the charitable mission of medicine. So one of the things that I like to say is the mission of medicine has been taken over by the business of healthcare. And doctors and clinics and hospitals aren't even allowed to be charitable. They aren't acting charitable. They're instead acting, um, uh, I wouldn't say extortion, but a predatory. Hmm. It's more predatory. And so they've completely lost the mission of medicine, which has long been there to take care of the sick, uh, to charge an affordable, reasonable price, to be charitable, not only in just providing charity, but in a charitable mindset, to spend the time that you need to take care of the patient the right way, not put them on a conveyor belt and say, you've got five minutes, tell me what your problem is. Yeah, I may not understand it. I'm just going to give you a minute. I hope you feel better. And please don't come back because that was too long of a story. I mean, I've actually had doctors who say, you're, who I hear have said, your story is too long. Okay, well, you're supposed to be my doctor, not my conveyor yeah. belt mechanic. Yeah. <laughs> right? So yeah, the, the whole system has been taken over by third-party payment. And people love the idea that things are free, but they're not free. Their entire lives are at stake and their freedom is at stake. Yeah. Yeah, I I like how you're differentiating between a healthcare plan and insurance because I do think it's important. And prior to even reading the book, that's what I would tell people. I'm like, this isn't how insurance should operate. I didn't realize that we're not dealing with insurance. We're dealing with healthcare plans. But I would tell people, I'm like, if if you have some minor issue going on. If you have a cold or something like that, that's something you should just go to your doctor, you should pay for it, and you're done. There should be no interaction with a third party, but then the insurance should be there for, I get diagnosed with cancer or something like that, something that is going to be a significant financial burden over the right. coming years. That's why you have that insurance. Just like auto insurance, um, when you have uh, your your plan for covering accidents that you get into it's not like you're involving your auto insurance every time you go to get maintenance on your car or anything like that it's for those events that are going to be ten thousand dollars twenty thousand thirty thousand dollars like rare unexpected and yeah just so your amount that you're paying should be fairly insignificant it should be Basically, okay, this is just there in case. That's what insurance is there, in case, essentially, right? Yeah. So it's just wild to see this landscape that we're in now. Well, and Medicare. So if your listeners happen to be in Medicare, they know this. But if your listeners are not in Medicare, they won't know this. They won't understand what a welfare program Medicare is. So um, Medicare studies show that people who have paid into Medicare they receive about three times the amount of services as the money that they put in. This is one of the reasons Medicare is running out of money and is scheduled to be bankrupt in 2036. But before we ever get there, there'll just be more and more and more and more rationing as they try to extend, extend, extend that deadline, right? But it's totally running out of money. And um, But when you see a Medicare, they aren't even Medicare bills. You won't get a Medicare bill from your let's just say your oncologist or your, you know, um, eye doctor or whatever, you'll get a summary statement. And then they'll tell you what you owe after that. 
But what Medicare does is it lops off about 60% of the charge, and then it pays 80% of that, and it leaves 20% for the person who's in Medicare. This is part B, essentially, but it can also be, um, well, no, this is really part B. Anyway, so that which is the clinic part and the medical care, et cetera. Hospitalization is a little bit different. Anyway, so let's just say you have a $1,000 bill, right? So Medicare says, whoop, take $600 off of that. So it doesn't matter that the doctor charged, it doesn't matter how much time, whether it was even valued at that, or if they're trying to say $1,000 in hopes of getting something meaningful at the end after everything's lopped off, right? So you got a $1,000 bill, Medicare lops off $600. uh, Then we have, what is that? 80% of $600. So Medicare pays 480. Is that 80%? I'm doing the math, right? 480, and then the the patient is told to pay $120 for this $1,000 procedure. And so, um, so, you know, you have this minuscule amount that the patient actually pays and this huge amount that the practitioner never sees. Hmm. And so this entire gaming system of the prices, and if you think about the fact that there are 67 million people in Medicare and all of these prices are being locked off. And the patient is only paying this minuscule little 20%. And probably thinking, if they're not really looking at their bills, thinking, well, this is you know the price of the bill. If they're looking at their bills, it's, they're thinking, well, I'm so glad I have Medicare because yeah. I couldn't have paid that $1,000. But that $1,000 is probably at that price, hoping to get to the bottom price of $600. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's just this huge gaming uh, piece that's going on with Medicare. And then Medicare is decreasing what they'll pay for doctors. They they're they just decreased it by, I think, 1.7%. And then they want to do another 2 point whatever percent. And so doctors are thinking about getting out. More and more doctors are thinking about getting out of Medicare. And there's going to be almost 80 million people in Medicare looking at a short list of actual physicians that are willing to stay in. This is something the American population doesn't understand. They don't know that Medicare is like slipping away right yeah. under them financially and who's going to give them the care. When you're talking about this gaming in the system, and I, I've seen this not with Medicare, but just in general, um, I went to a chiropractor once and uh, I said, I, I had been pretty naive when it comes to using my uh, healthcare insurance or any, anything like that. And he asked me, he says, do you have insurance? And I said, yeah, I have insurance. And he's like, well, it's $30 without insurance and then whatever insurance is. And I, I didn't think about it, but I'm like, well, insurance, obviously I want to use insurance. And uh, I ended up with a much bigger bill in the, yep. in the long run because this, <laughs> what he says he can do for $30 ends up being billed as like, $300 worth of services each time. And I think this is insane that you go to a doctor and it's it's all about gaming the system because he knows he's going to bill $300. He's not going to get the full $300, but he's still going to end up with $100, $120, $90, whatever it might be that the insurance and him end up negotiating, whatever the uh, pre-designated amounts that they are. So th- would this be some of the same thing, some of the same gaming of the system that you're talking about? Yes. And then did you have an extra bill outside of whatever the insurance paid? Is that what you're saying about you paid more than 30? Yeah. Yeah. So he, I I think I had to dispute it. Um, I didn't like the way that he was running things, but yeah, he essentially billed me and then tried to bill me on top of what the insurance would pay too, which I'm pretty sure is not even legal. Could be a balanced billing thing. Yeah. Um, Particularly if he didn't have a contractual relationship with your insurance company. So there's a lot of Mm. those kind of things. But the fact of the matter is, if you use insurance, you force him to do all the paperwork with insurance. And so for $30, he doesn't do any paperwork. He's just like, you just hand him the $30 and you're out the door and he doesn't have to even talk to the insurance company. And it's a lot of paperwork and a lot of time and a lot of cost if it goes through the insurance company. And it's a loss for everybody. Yeah. 
when it comes to electronic health records and you you go into this extensively in your book, so obviously we can't touch on everything you covered in the book, but what are some of the problems that we're seeing? I mean, it seems like I've been in software for quite some time and normally software is meant to make our lives better. Like you use software, I was in the auto industry, you use software for that, and it makes communication between your employees a little bit better. It makes, um, you're connected to the internet, so whatever you put in the system can go right into the internet, upload it to, to the cloud, shared with other people, whatever it might be. But with healthcare, it seems a bit different. Like this isn't, it's not so helpful. And part of that seems to be, well, you have, you have a lot of entities. It seems like you have a lot of entities around the legislation putting estimates on what's going to be saved and what's going to be, uh, what are the benefits going to be. But then some of these same companies seem to be the ones benefiting off of the contracts that get contracted as a result of that. Am I wrong in anything I said there? Yeah, so the electronic health record mandate, which was part of the um, American um, Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, So it was uh, signed by President Obama exactly four weeks after he got into office. So you can see that it was all written and pre-planned before he ever Mm. arrived. And then he arrived and then, boom, he signed it. One of the most expensive bills that there's ever been. And it included this section that mandated the electronic health record to be in every exam room and every hospital uh, room. And not only did it have, okay, it mandated to be there or they would lose money on every Medicare patient that they saw. So it was a quasi mandate. So you could not use it, but then you're losing money. And as you uh, have heard already, there are more than 60 million people in Medicare. And so they would lose a lot of money in addition to the money that's already lopped off, right? Yeah. By the Medicare administration for every time that they cared for a Medicare patient. So it was essentially, you know, they were forced into it. Now, this is not just any electronic health record. And a lot of people had their own electronic health records uh, for their own clientele, lots of doctors, lots of clinics. They had come up with a with a design that worked for them. They worked with a software uh, EHR developer and made this thing happen to do exactly what they wanted it to do. But with this mandate, they couldn't have just any electronic health record. They couldn't keep their electronic health record It had to be a government certified electronic Mm. health record to do what the government wanted it to do. On top of that, it had to be used meaningfully. So there are meaningful use regulations that tell doctors and hospitals how they have to use this government electronic health record, which is what we call it, um, because it's all government certified. It's not just anyone, right? So there they have to use it the way the government wants them to use it, which is to report a lot of data and to essentially open up the medical record to all of these outsiders. And so this is not just, you know, a cool technology that will make everything easier. This is a technology put into the exam room to control the practice of medicine and to give all sorts of outsiders access for their own purposes and agendas. And there is a quote in the book by Dr. Scott Silverstein, and I'll just be paraphrasing it, but it's something like this, um, that the uh, electronic health record is a command and control system through which every mm, decision has to pass, controlling clinicians and medical decisions. So so when you go to the doctor's office and they're on the computer, that means they are in the electronic health record system of their clinic or of their hospital. And as you know, in any computer, you go up to a certain place and you, you click on the, the you click on it and a menu comes down, right? So you want to do XYZ for this patient who has this condition, but you look in the menu and you know what? X and Y are there, but not Z. And the hospital has decided, no, I don't want any of you to do Z. So I'm not even going to put it in there. So you can't even order it. 
So this is why it is a command and control system. Outsiders decide what the doctor can even order. And they and the menu might look different, like ivermectin, for example. Ivermectin was available as something to order for somebody who had scabies. But if they had COVID, it wouldn't even pop up yeah. in the menu. Now they could they could declare the COVID patient to have scabies so that they could pull down and get the ivermectin and order the ivermectin. But a lot of hospitals were totally against ivermectin, just took ivermectin out of their um, pharmacies or, you know, just didn't make it available. Yeah. Right. So this is a command and control system. It's not a handy dandy technology uh, that uh, is there to help people. It's actually there to control. I, I had a little bit of experience with the ivermectin thing in uh, 2021. I can't remember uh, toward the end of the year, I finally got exposed to COVID and, and I couldn't control the exposure. So I was like, okay, I, I'm not vaccinated. I want to, I want to have some assurance that like whatever I can have. And uh, I got a prescription of ivermectin and I was told I could not, I, I went to multiple pharmacies mm -hmm. and they would not let me fill the prescription, which I thought was bizarre because they, they demanded to know why I was mm -hmm. filling it. There's like, if this is for COVID, we can't fill it. I'm like, when, when in my life have I been asked by a pharmacist what my prescription is for? My doctor decides what I prescription I get. I talked with my doctor about that. You, you consult in possible interactions. That's what a pharmacy does. You don't tell me like you're, you're basically taking the place of a doctor right now. Right. You're, overriding a doctor, which seems asinine to have that kind of situation. And you're basically saying that this is the electric, electronic health record in action in those situations. Is that right? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so I don't know how you got the ivermectin prescription, but for most doctors, it wasn't even available to mm -hmm. order. Yeah. Um, now you could, you know, do a written one, but if you were being judged or profiled on what you provided, then whoever employed you, because most of the doctors, because of the electronic health record, because it's an unfunded mandate, a lot of doctors actually had to give up their private practices. I think that's another reason, another way the electronic health record is pushing us toward a socialized government run system. Because 75% of the doctors today are employed by outsiders under somebody else's control because they could not afford the cost of the electronic health record. Hmm. So, um, and so if they were to, you know, try to prescribe ivermectin, their overseers, their employers would see this and could potentially tell them that you're terminated. And that yeah. happened to a variety of doctors around the country. Um, where they lost their jobs because they tried to give ivermectin or they argued for ivermectin or they told patients that the shots might be dangerous for them and they aren't fully, you know, vetted and that sort of thing. And, you know, that was, there were people reporting on each other. There, there were nurses and scribes reporting on doctors' conversations with a patient where the doctor would say, you know, it's probably a better idea that you don't get the shot because of X, Y, and Z. And then the scribe would say, Dr. So-and-so, said not to get the shot when we're reporting, then Dr. So-and-so is called up by the employer. I mean, it was just uh, terrible, which, um, so I'll just bring this back up. So we have the wedge of health freedom to, to essentially create a parallel uh, healthcare system of freedom, a framework of freedom outside of today's uh, system. We're not trying to reform the system of today. We essentially want to call patients and practitioners out of today's system and have them move to a cash-based system mm. uh, that we've got about 500 doctors and, and practices on now. There's four cash-based pharmacies. We've got some surgeons and surg sur uh, surgery centers, and um, we even have dentists. Mm. And eventually we're going to have hospitals because we need to have hospitals that aren't con in control, under control of outsiders. Yeah. Uh, and eventually a medical school. So doctors actually being trained to be doctors rather than being DEI doctors, uh, which is what medical schools are training them to be today. And that's a dangerous thing. So we really do need, so we do not have what happened with COVID and all these people died needlessly. All these doctors are responsible for not using their brains and just following the protocols and not thinking and not actually trying to heal or cure. 
uh, their patients. They're responsible. I don't care what the protocols say. You have an ethical obligation to your patient to do the best for your patient, not to follow a protocol. That is, mm-hmm. that is not a, that's nowhere in the ethical obligation of a physician to a patient. So anyway, we need to stop that. And so we've got the Wedge of Health Freedom at jointhewedge.com, jointhewedge.com, where people can go find a doctor who's already doing this. They may or may not be a doctor who wants uh, shots or that you agree with, but at least they are independently practicing. They're not under control of insurance. They're not under control of government. They take no insurance. They take no government. They take cash. Nice. Um, When I look at software, having worked in software for a number of years, I I see it as, okay, let's say you're running a hospital and you need some software and I create software. I make the software that you can run your hospital with. And, uh, you know, you can have an internal system. Mm -hmm. As the person providing the software, I'm you're my customer at that point. I need to make sure that my product is up to par for your use. I need to make you happy as my customer. It seems like with the electronic health records, instead of just having this two-way relationship, you have another person, another party, the government, basically saying, well, no, you you can't get rid of him. You can't leave that software. You have to use the software. Uh, so I have no incentive as the software provider to actually do anything that you want. Um, maybe you can find a competitor that can do a little bit more of what you want, but it's going to be the same situation. You have to have me or them or one of the other options. That's essentially the situation that we're looking at is like there that relationship between customer and software provider is gone because it's just mandated. So when the mandate came out in 2009, every doctor and every hospital had five years to put in a government certified electronic health record. Mm. Uh, as you maybe saw in the book, more than a thousand EHR development companies just popped out of the woodwork, uh, offering this to all of these doctors and hospitals around the country. And I, if I recall correctly, one of the quotes in the book goes something like this from a clinic. Like you had all of these people at your beck and call when you were trying to figure out which EHR to buy and to get the whole thing, uh, you know, figured out and to sign on the dotted line and then poof, they were gone. They'd yeah. gotten their client. And now when it came to actually helping the doctors, the clinic, the staff figure out how to work the thing, uh, they were not there. Figuring out how to deal with the problems, they were not there. Because the mandate was simply that you have it in your office, that it didn't work for you, the doctor, didn't work for you, the patient, wasn't specific to your practice. That didn't matter. (laughs) They were off and doing some other project for some other person, right? And so, you know, over time, so it's been, you know, more than 10 years since the electronic health record has been in the exam room now. Um, A lot of the doctors, a lot of the hospitals have shifted to EPIC, the Epic Electronic Health Record, which is out of Verona, Wisconsin. And um, uh, Judith Faulkner, who did this, uh, has really commandeered. She's become a billionaire, I think, more than once <laughs> uh, or times over. And um, But a lot of people will say that Epic is kind of clunky. But mm. really, they don't have a choice. If they want to be fully paid, they have to use an electronic health record system. And the one that has been uh, the most responsive, let's say, or has the most pieces that they need to do all this government reporting and also reporting to the health plans and anything else that they have to show in order to be paid. This is all about being paid. If they don't follow all this, they can't be paid. And then they just go away, right? They won't be a doctor anymore. Um, And so really, I think it was reported recently that I think Epic has something like, oh, I I just can't even remember. But they have they have the lion's share of the healthcare community, and so they also have the lion's share of everybody's data. Hmm. And Judith Faulkner, I quote her in the book, and she says she doesn't want it to be an electronic health record, an EHR. She wants it to be a CHR, a comprehensive health record with everything about your life in that record, which would mean it just becomes a an enormous dossier on yeah. every person 
uh, in this country because every person has to go to the exam room. Every person becomes a patient. And when you go, you are a vulnerable person. You think you have to answer all the questions. You don't. You shouldn't. We actually have a special um, document called uh, CCHF Discharge Instructions. It's on our homepage under Helpful Handouts. Um, to tell you how to deal with what's happening in the exam room when they're trying to gather all this information on you. But so, you know, she wants a CHR. She wants, she said she wanted to know when you slept, how many hours you slept, when you ate. You know, she wants to know all of this. She wants it all in the electronic health record. Then she, the head of Epic, has all of this data to do whatever she wants to with it. And of course, under HIPAA, she can also share it and sell it. And do all sorts of things that don't sound like selling, like, you know, you need it for analysis. Okay, I'll give you so much. You'll give me so much money to have it for analysis and that sort of thing for your business, right? But they are. They're selling, buying and selling patient data for their own purposes. Yeah. One thing that's kind of curious about that is if you, if your doctor or Epic, let's say, if they share your data with somebody, um, is that? The next person that they share, are they under HIPAA obligations as well? Because there's no, how does that work? Um, so to be fair to Epic, I do recall something now that I'm thinking about it, that Epic doesn't do a lot of sharing of the data, but they still have the data on all yeah. on their own. But it's really up to them uh, under HIPAA how much they share because they would be one of the business associates. Uh, mm. And so... Then there is also a business associate agreement. So there has to be business associate agreements. Even if hospital A decides to share all of your data with hospital B and share all the data of everyone in hospital A and hospital B says, well, we'll share all our data with you too. And boom, they just get all of each other's data, right? They have to have a business associate agreement between the two of them. That is part of HIPAA. But, you know, what does that mean to the patient? The patient didn't have any choice in the matter. Yeah. Uh, sometimes what I like to say is um, when people say, you know, HIPAA is about protecting your privacy. No, no, no. More than anything, what HIPAA is, is a security arrangement. They say that they will keep your data secure while they allow it to be shared hither and yon mm-hmm. without your consent. So, yeah. so all of the ways they allow you to share the data, they promise to keep your data secure. But of course, the security and the loss of the privacy and the loss of the security is in all of the sharing without your consent, yeah. right? They're just talking about digitally or mechanically or whatever. They will sh- they will protect your data, but your data is your data and they don't have any right to share it. But HIPAA gave them the right. Yeah. With, they- uh, oh, sorry. With this, we have an upcoming election. Um it looks like it's either going to be Kamala Harris and whoever her VP pick is versus Trump and, and Vance. If uh, if Kamala Harris ends up being president in 2024, going forward, do you expect to see any changes there versus a Trump-Vance White House? Because it seems like this is bipartisan in a bad way, like bipartisan <laughs> in the sense that Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. They're both on board with the EHR and uh, they're all in favor of HIPAA, which I know with HIPAA, if the state doesn't have anything that ensures more privacy than HIPAA, then it defaults to HIPAA. So with those two administrations being possible uh, after November, do you see any differences between them as far as the healthcare landscape and how it will be navigated? Well, it's my hope that President Trump learned a lot of lessons in his first four years and in the four years that followed uh, to understand that he didn't really understand a lot about health care, the issue of health care. He said a lot of things that a conservative would not say about health care, like we've got to keep the pre-existing conditions provision. Keeping the pre-existing conditions provision actually means that we don't have insurance, period, anymore. Because insurance is to insure against uh, things that have not yet happened that are insurable events. So disasters that have not happened. If you've already had a disaster, if you've already burned your house down, you are not going to get homeowner's insurance. You're not going to get it. So real insurance is about what hasn't happened, but is a risk that it could happen. 
So when President Trump said, you know, we're not getting rid of the the pre-existing condition provisions, it's like, okay, well, now you just said that you wanted to have, you know, socialized medicine of the corporate version. But he didn't know it. I don't really, I really don't think he knows it. Uh, he may not still know it today. But the things that I think could um, happen under Trump, Vance versus Kamala, question mark. <laughs> and I come from Minnesota where everybody's saying, well, Walls might be it. Governor Walls might be it. Well, I guess we'll see. Uh, but anyway, um, under Kamala, we will move closer and closer to national health care through Medicare. She wants Medicare for all. She's always wanted Medicare for all. So she would try to move everybody into Medicare. She'd try to move everybody into uh, health plans or completely out of health plans and have the whole government run it. And so there is some sense, like here in Minnesota, where they actually passed a law to try to get health plans completely out of the Medicaid system and have the government run it itself, which is taking it back to how Medicaid and Medicare uh, used to be before they let the health plans in. So there is some sense of that on the Democrat side that they don't want the health plans in. And that's probably what would happen with Kamala. If she could swing it, she'd probably have Medicare for all run by the government. Um, and then, of course, she she would probably be have a lot more DEI, all this wokeness in medical school. So the medical schools are being perfused with DEI agendas, which is a very dangerous thing for patients. I don't actually think that we would see that in Trump advance and they would probably be, they would probably rise up against it. Um, Trump and Vance, we would hope that they would um, do an, another executive order like Trump did for us in 2019, uh, Section 11 of Executive Order 13890 says that people can leave Medicare, they can opt out of Medicare uh, voluntarily and still get their Social Security benefits. Now, this is something that people don't understand. They don't even know what the Clintons did in 1993 was they connected uh, Medicare enrollment with Social Security benefits. And they put it in a book, no law, no rule, no nothing. They put it in a book and said, if you don't enroll in Medicare, you can't have your Social Security benefits. They also hmm. said, if you disenroll from Medicare at any time, you have to pay back all the Social Security benefits and all the Medicare benefits that you have received. Again, not a law, not a rule. Just somebody in the Clinton administration did this. We got an executive order to split the two of them, but COVID intervened and then Trump wasn't reelected and then Biden rescinded the order. So mm -hmm. because Vance very much wants sanity, fiscal sanity put back into Medicare and because Trump already did that for us, I think that we could get that pretty easily and we could at least open the door out of Medicare because Medicare is just going to become a one big rationing system. And as soon as you can't advocate for yourself or protect yourself, you are going to find your life, you know, uh, on the, on the tinder hooks because <laughs> they're going to decide that there's no more care for you. Um, and then I think, uh, out of Trump and Vance, we would see no Medicare, no Medicaid for illegals. Um, I think out of Trump and Vance, we would see the um, freedom of conscience uh, protections for healthcare workers restored. Uh, we might get Medicaid uh, blocks where the state would have a certain amount of Medicaid money and they'd be able to use it as they saw fit rather than having th this open spigot to go to and for every Medicaid thing that you can come up with, which is what states are doing now. And I think they would ratchet down on, on Medicare and uh, overpayments because there's a lot of Medicare overpayments. So, but, you know, it is really anybody's guess. And and I do think under Trump and Vance, there would be no lockdowns. Vance had a bill and got it into law uh, against mask mandates. I don't think there'd be any vaccine mandates. I think Trump learned his lesson and Vance certainly knows uh, the whole thing that happened, even even if Vance might like vaccines, I don't think he'd go for the vaccine mandate. But certainly under Kamala, she would be trying to get the states to impose it all. Yeah, I, I think uh, you can be pro-vaccine, but you don't have to be pro-mandate on that. When it comes to long-term solutions, because some of that, some of what we're discussing right now with the two administrations being possible is a little... It's like having your head on a swivel. It's like, you know, Trump 
files an executive order, Biden rescinds it. Now Trump can do it again. Whoever's next could rescind it. It, What's the long-term solution for this? Because if we're just, if it's just based on whoever gets office and for the white house, they're, they're going to do some executive orders might last four years, might not. It, it, feels like we're just kind of constantly in this state of like wondering what's going to happen and not knowing anything for sure. So how do we get past that and get to a long-term solution? It would be good to have a real Republican in office, which had real conservative America as a Republic constitutional Republic ideals and have uh, Republicans on both in house and Senate and have them move forward on what needs to happen like the Democrats did on their agenda. And Republicans don't tend to do this much to many Republicans on the ground, much to their dismay. Right. Um, uh, And so what they really need, they need to let people out of Medicare. There's a lot of people who need to have access to um, coverage for a lifetime, not having to go into Medicare. We have to get third party payment out. So we have to return real insurance. Obamacare actually prohibits real insurance. We have to bring it back. Uh, and we have to let people take their entire compensation from their employer. We have to move away from employer sponsored coverage and back to individually owned private uh, health insurance that nobody gets in the middle of, nobody controls. Let the market work. Let the competition uh, happen. Get all of these third party profiteering fingers out of there uh, and make sure that we don't get socialized medicine. I really feel like the health plans have to go away because they are the corporate version of socialized medicine. And if people get real insurance, which is marked at a real insurance price, which is very affordable, you only pull it out when you have a catastrophe and insurable event, all the prices come down to the pocketbook because that's where most of the things are going to be paid out of. All the third party hands get out of there, all the Reporting gets out of there. Doctors go back to just being doctors and not uh, data clerks. That's what has to happen. So they're, you know, just getting the third party out, having real insurance, being able to escape Medicare and being able to escape employer sponsored coverage. And all of that would just be a a revolution uh, on healthcare in the United States. What what made you start uh, the Citizens Council for Health Freedom? Like what? What led to that, um, you leaving, not just being an RN anymore and pursuing this activism? So I started watching what the Clintons wanted to do. And then I felt led. I'm a Christian. I felt led once I saw what their plan was. I'm like, somebody's got to stop them after the president gave his speech in September uh, 1993 and, and laid out his plan. I thought, oh, no, 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 because if they take over healthcare, they'll take over the country. And all of us saw how that worked with COVID. Now, if they, if nobody ever believed me before, we saw what happened, uh, during COVID. And so that's really how it started. I, I saw that they wanted to do essentially HMOs for all, which are now called health plans. Obamacare is health plans for all except if you are exempt because you are in a medical sharing organization. And so just that's, that's really how it began. And so I've been doing this work for basically 30 years. Awesome. Well, Twyla, it's been awesome talking to you. I, I obviously, I, I highly recommend your book. I, I think you. it's extremely informative. I love to ask people what other books they recommend. Are there any other books that you've read that have been helpful in your journey? Uh, for this? Oh, I, I read a lot of books. Um, right now I'm reading um, Claire Craig's book and it's called Expired. Hmm. And it's three different versions of Expired. And it's very interesting. She has statistics about COVID that none of us even know. They just like counter everything about this whole idea of how exposures happen and virus and everything. So uh, that's been very useful. I have the book on um, Fauci, I have books on uh, coverage and healthcare in general and, and listening to doctors talk about their own journeys of why they became doctors and how special it is to have a patient-doctor relationship. But do the titles pop up to me? No. I will say that there's one called um, uh, Medicare, oh yeah, written by a good friend of mine, Sue Blevins. 
And oh, if you just look up Sue Blevins and Medicare, you will see it. It really explains Medicare and the history of Medicare. And I think everybody should look at that and they can see that putting 19 million people in uh, Medicare for free who never paid a dime into it shows how Medicare is a Ponzi scheme that has led us to where we are today. And it shows how the whole plan here, starting with Harry S. Truman, was to bring us to national health care. And this whole thing, the entire thing you're seeing in healthcare today is the fight between health freedom uh, and independence of doctors and patients uh, and national health care and government takeover of the entire uh, industry. And it really started with Medicare. And this book that Sue Blevins wrote on uh, Medicare is, you know, just really amazing. It's, it's small. It's a small little book. Really important. Oh, uh, there's another one called Co Code Blue written by Edward Annis. And he explains uh, this whole thing about Medicare and how it started as well and how they did it off of for the martyred president, JFK. Johnson did that on behalf of the martyred president. But JFK had decided before he was ever assassinated that Medicare was a bad idea. But Johnson mm. liked it. And so he used these words for the martyred president just to make it happen. And that book uh, explains that. Interesting. Well, Twilight, it's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Before we wrap up, I want to hand it over to you to let listeners know where they can find you, where they can get your book, and then anything else you'd like to share today. Well, uh, thanks so much. Um, they can find us at cchfreedom.org, cchfreedom.org. If they don't have internet, of course, they can call us at 651-646-8935. But I guess they're watching you, so they probably got internet. Um, they can find the book anywhere where books are sold. This is the fourth um, uh, printing of the book. It has eight awards. And uh, so they can find it on Amazon or other places. And I do encourage them to go to patienttoolbox.org, which is how we try to help you in the exam room. And if you're still having COVID, it's a place for you to find resources on COVID. And then, yeah, just go to jointhewedge.com to find a doctor who works for you, jointhewedge.com. Awesome. Twyla, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. I really appreciate you taking the time with me today. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Thoughtfully Mindless. If our conversations resonate with you, consider leaving a five-star review on Apple and Spotify. It goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners. If you'd like to support the show, you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab, where you can find my Amazon affiliate store where I have brands that I personally use, and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media, on X at RDTM Podcast and Instagram at Thoughtfully Mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless.